Chat with Traders, episode 150, is brought to you by the award-winning online broker, TradeStation. TradeStation clients have direct access to stocks, ETFs, futures, and options using one integrated trading platform, which has many professional-grade features to help you better analyze and trade markets. Learn more about TradeStation, their friendly pricing structure, and open an account at tradestation.com slash traders. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hey team, what is up? Welcome to episode 150. This is part two of my interview with Aaron Brown, and I dare say this may be better than the first. If you happen to miss part one, that's okay. It's not like this episode won't make sense to you. You'll be able to follow along just fine. And if you would like to hear part one still, you can go to chatwithtraders.com slash 149. And the show notes for this episode can be found at chatwithtraders.com slash 150. Now, just to refresh your memory, Aaron Brown is a very well-respected risk manager. He's worked in the field of risk management for approximately 30 years. And notably, for the past decade, Aaron was the risk manager of AQR, a $200 billion quant fund. So coming up on this episode, part two, you'll gain some deeper insight to how you can better understand and manage risk for yourself. We go over questions traders should be asking themselves, how to leave less money on the table, high win rate versus low win rate strategies, black swans, killing opportunity while trying too hard to prevent disaster, and that's certainly not all. I must say, I truly enjoyed this conversation. I think there's so much you can take away from it. And I also liked how Aaron pushed back on a couple of my questions, which I guess somewhat missed the point. So it was good of him to redirect the line of conversation to focus on more appropriate ways of articulating risk. Anyway, let's get on with the show now. Here is part two of A Lesson in Risk Taking with Aaron Brown. Just to set the scene for the next part of our conversation, Aaron, you know, this might sound like a very simple question, but I feel like I should ask it anyway. What is risk? Like when we talk about risk, what are we talking about? And also just to take it one step further, what is risk management? Like what does that mean? Well, I think I like to start with uh, thinking about all the words people use for risk. Uh, and this is not just true in English, it's true in many languages. You know, you can talk about somebody being, you know, restless, careless, speculative, risky, whatever. That's if you don't like their risks they're taking. Or you can talk about someone being bold, innovative, outside the box if you do like the risks they're taking. And it's kind of odd that, that we really don't have very many words for risk that don't express an opinion about it. You know, if you're a quant, you can say, you know, he chose the option with higher volatility, but that's pretty dry and technical, not really uh, a part of the language. People are very used to, it's deeply ingrained in our thinking, our culture, that you wait till after you know what happened to evaluate uh, a risk. Um, clearly, <laughs> uh, that doesn't work for trading. It doesn't work for anything else, really, but it's clearest in trading. Uh, so a trader has to have a really different view of risk. Risk is what we exploit. Risk is like energy. It can shock you, it can burn you, it can blow you up, uh, but without it, you can't get anything done. Um, you know, if prices didn't move, then there wouldn't be any trading. If they weren't different in different places, nobody would ever, you know, move goods and do trading. So risk is something good. It's, it's like energy. It's something we have to exploit, but it's also something we have to respect very deeply. It's uh, much more powerful than any individual. And if you miscalculate it or you don't respect it, uh, it can end your trading career quickly and uh, finally. Yeah. So you said risk is good. I mean, I feel as though most people like your everyday sort of person, maybe not traders so much probably doesn't share that same view. They probably think risk is got a negative connotation attached to it. Do you feel like that's the case? 
Well, you know, they do. It depends on the context in which you ask them. And you say, you know, you want to put your money in a risky investment. And they say, oh, no way. I don't want to do that. But you say, you know, you want to uh, invest in this innovative new company with a bold new product. And they say, sure, yeah. So, so they're not really consistent about it. The reason I think most people uh, tend to reflexively dislike risk is they have this life plan or this worldview, what they tend to do, they tend to plan things out. And if you have a plan, you say, I'm going to do this, and that's going to do this, and this, and this, you got 12 steps in your plan. Well, if any one of those steps goes wrong, your plan is worthless. So you really need everything to be very predictable. And people like that. It's predictable, they can plan it. Uh, other people, and I suspect most of our listeners following this group, get incredibly bored. The idea that, you know, you're going to know exactly what you do tomorrow, you know, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to have coffee with him, and then I'm going to work on this report. You know, that's the most boring, imaginable life. You don't want to plan everything 12 steps ahead. You want to look for opportunities as they come up and grab them. Um, and if something unexpected happens, you look for opportunities in it rather than uh, uh, complaining about it happening. Um, just two different incompatible kinds of people, and the world needs both. And, uh, you know, it's not worth arguing about which one is right. If you don't have that attitude, if you basically are a risk avoider, if you really like to plan everything out in your life, you're probably not going to be either happy or successful as a trader. I was going to ask you this a little bit later, but I figure now is probably as good a point as any. How can traders become more comfortable with taking risk? You know, because some people probably are quite conservative or, or, you know, some people certainly are quite conservative. How can they become more comfortable with the idea of taking risk? You know, I, I don't like that question because it, um, it, it it sort of suggests that you've got to, you know, change your mental attitude toward it. And, and that's not really the point. You know, risk is something mainly that you calculate. Um, and if, if, you know, if you know what to do, if you're a good trader, you know what trades you should make, but, but you're afraid of making them. Um, I just, you know, I, I mean, I don't think you're cut out for the business just as, and there are people in this group too, you know, they're gamblers, they're thrill seekers. They can't stop trading even when there's no edge, you know, you really got to have a indifference in some sense, uh, to risk, you know, when the opportunities are there, you got to grab them, whether you're feeling optimistic or pessimistic. And when the opportunities aren't there, you got to sit back and wait, even if you're, you know, uh, restless and bored and, and, and want to do something. One of the biggest reasons people fail at trade, well, the biggest reason people fail at trading is they don't do the basic homework to know what they should do. But assuming you get past that and you have the basic homework, I am amazed at the number of people who go into trading without really the focus goal on making money. You know, they want to have fun trades so they can impress their girlfriend. They want to, you know, live out some fantasy of uh, beating the markets. Uh, they want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make steady profits every day. They want excitement, whatever, whatever they want. If you want anything except money, you're probably going to fail at trading. You got to have a very careful focus. So this is my job. I'm here to make money. Nothing else matters. I'm going to calculate my edge. You can't always calculate it right. I'll make mistakes. I'll have bad trades. I'll trade too high, too low, too, you know, too big, too small sometimes. But it's all calculation and it's not, there's no emotional content. There's no moral content to it. I don't feel uh, like I'm a bad person when I lose money. Um, I don't feel like I'm, you know, the smartest person in the world when I make money. Um, it's a calculation. If I can do it consistently in the long run, I will prosper. Um, and if I don't, then I should find another thing to do. Do you think that's a conscious a conscious thing that people do. Like you said, you're surprised by how people come into trading but don't have the the ultimate goal of making money. They, they kind of do it more so they can brag about good trades and, and show off a little bit. Is that something they do consciously though? Because I imagine if you were to ask any trader why you're doing this, the, the answer in most cases would be to, to make money. But now this goes back to something we talked about uh, last time. Um, People, many people don't really know why they do what they do. So you have some person and he's kind of bored in his job and uh, he kind of watches the stock market or body market or whatever it is he want, he's going to trade. And he kind of makes some mental calls that seem to be going right. And he imagines himself in this great life where he's, you know, sitting at a desk with his feet up on the uh, table, got 
some beautiful assistants running around. Um, and uh, he's calling, you know, do a million of that, stop a million of that. And uh, meanwhile, you know, money is pouring in his bank account. Um, and and ultimately, what he's really doing, his brain is saying, yeah, that's an attractive thing. I'd like that life. That sounds like fun. So his brain decides he's going to try to do it. And he rationalizes it in his conscious mind, like he's made some sort of rational calculation that he can make money trading. But he's really doing it because he's in pursuit of this silly illusion uh, that isn't going to happen. And even if it did happen, it actually probably wouldn't be anywhere near as much fun as it as, as it seems in um, imagination. The people who tend to be the best traders are people who, um, I want to say this is something that the writer uh, William Faulkner said about writing. He said, the only reason to become a writer is because you can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, the people who are the best traders are doing it because they really can't imagine anything else that, that they want to do that gives them this kind of excitement, that gives them this sort of satisfaction. They see edges and they have to take advantage of them, and that's just part of who they are. That's a brilliant quote, actually. I, I really dig that. For yourself, Aaron, how come you've been successful as a risk manager? Like, what are the things which you've done well? Well, I, I was naturally a good risk manager for myself. Um, I kind of had the right mindset going in. And then I had years of practice, you know, from age 14 on living off the results of my bets. And that, you know, very quickly erodes away any, any bad habits you have. You know, it's uh, uh, one of the things I think about risk taking is you really want to start it young because um, you wouldn't survive the consequences if you started learning it at adult stakes. So, you know, when you're doing it at childhood stakes, you can do things that sear very deeply into your unconscious and change your whole personality without, you know, killing yourself or without, you know, losing a million dollars. As you get older and, you know, you get a little wealthier and your decisions have more consequences and your emotions get more uh, insulated from things, it's hard to get the same kind of learning um, without actually hurting yourself. So... So that's number one. So, but there are a lot of people who can do that. I then got very introspective. I really tried to understand it both as a quantitative uh, discipline, you know, sort of a problem of mathematics, and also what it really feels like, what it really means um, when you're trying to uh, do good trades. I don't think I'm the best risk taker, risk manager that ever there was. I think I'm very good at it. And among the people who are very good at it, I might be the best person at explaining it. And that's really what it means to be a good risk manager. Uh, you can't be a good risk manager for other people if you can't do it yourself, but you also have to be able to explain it. A lot of the best traders are very bad at explaining how they handle risk. Okay. So, do you just want to drill down into that a little further? When you talk about explaining risk, what do you mean by that? Um, so, you know, you, let's say, let's... Uh, take an example, you got a trader and, you know, he's had a run of bad trades and he comes to you and he wants to do this big trade that's going to, you know, win back all of the uh, losses. And this is a real crucial moment in a career. This is the kind of decision that if you make it wrong, uh, you're not going to be successful as a trader. If he is really just trying to chase past losses, if he is trying to swing big because uh, he wants to make up for past losses, then, you know, it's disastrous. You can't do it. But it is often the case that the best opportunities come up uh, after a series of losses, either because you've learned something for those losses or because those losses have moved things even closer to your trade thesis. And if you're not willing to, you know, um, make those big bets after losses, you'll never make them up. You know, you'll be in a hole forever. So here you have this key moment and you have to look at this person and you really have to help them through it. And, and, and they have to make the decision. You know, risk manager, you could just say yes or no, right? You can veto the trade. You can tell them to do it. But you're not really helping. I mean, you're helping them with this one decision maybe, but you're not, they're not learning anything. you got to really lead them to the right decision. Get them to ask the right questions of themselves and answer it for themselves so they feel uh, why they're doing the right thing. Um, and a lot of the coaching you do as a risk manager is in these kind of stressful situations. Another one that, you know, probably happier one, but, but happens a lot is, you know, somebody's done this trade. It's made three times as much money as he ever thought. 
but it still looks like it's got some juice left in it, you know, and part of him wants to say, I just want to lock in the, pro I'll be really happy with this trade, even if I never make another penny on it. Um, but, you know, you can't walk away from those extra profits because sometimes the opposite happens and you got to, you know, have money in the bank to pay for those. These are the kinds of situations where you'd really like to talk to somebody who's an experienced trader and who's thought it through and who knows what questions you should be asking and can look you in the eye and say, you know, no, you know, what you're telling me is not what you're really uh, acting on. Can you give us an example of a couple questions that traders should be asking themselves or, you know, if they have access to someone more experienced uh, about risk? Like, some questions that traders maybe often ignore, don't even think about, or just plain simply don't ask themselves. Well, I guess the first one, and this is almost a definition of being a trader. You know, a lot of people come up to you and they say, you know, I think, I think, you know, gold has is, is, got to go up in price, or I think that, you know, the stocks are overvalued. And, and the first question I ask is I say, um, okay, how much would things have to move in the other direction before you would decide you were wrong? And if the person has never even thought about that question, I just know right away they're not a trader um, because they're not really, you know, they're, they're planning one course. This is like the risk avoiders. They plan the most likely course or they plan what they think is going to happen and they get mad when, you know, things don't go as they plan. A trader has to be able to really internalize, not just, you know, give lip service to, not just write it down on a piece of paper, has to really internalize kind of two ideas. One is that they might be right. Uh, and one is that they might be wrong. And each one of those views has, has, you know, consequences to it. And so if you thought about a trade, if you've thought about it in trader terms, you have an idea for, okay, when I say gold is going up, I'm thinking that, you know, here's the approximate amount of money I would want to make on the trade. And if it went in this direction by $200 or something, I would know that I was wrong or, or perhaps, you know, something had come in to change the situation that I didn't expect, or maybe I was just wrong in my analysis. And those are kind of the first two numbers you think about when you're trying to think about the risk of the trade. How much does it make if you're right? And how much does it lose if you're wrong? Of course, there's a lot more work to do after that. But if you haven't even thought of that, if you just thought of one scenario, there's nothing a risk manager can do for you. There are some people, really great traders, who can, you know, think of three or four or five scenarios and really hold them in their mind at the same time. But uh, that's pretty rare. And I don't know how useful it is. You know, if you really have two good scenarios and, you know, you plan a trade that, that works for those, um, you're going to do most of the work uh, that you need to do to make good risk decisions in trading. Would you say... As a risk manager, you focus more on what there is to lose instead of what there is to gain, or do you focus on both with somewhat equal weights? No, no it's, it's got to be exactly equal weight. If, if anything, you focus more on uh, the opportunities that on the downside, which you're really thinking most of the time, uh, you don't want to uh, have like intermediate, um, you know, cut your losses early kind of things. You kind of figure out how much you're willing to lose if you're wrong. And there's no great advantage in losing less than that. Um, typically, you want to, you know, go with the idea until you've lost what you're willing to lose. And then, uh, and that's when you get out if you're, you know, on the, on the downside. So on the downside, you're kind of looking at a floor, a limit, like, you know, okay, what's the worst that can happen? So how am I going to deal with that? Once you decide, okay, I can survive, if, if the worst happens, you know, my plan isn't completely uh, thrown out, I can still make my annual goals, whatever, then you stop, you don't think too much about that. Then you start thinking, okay, now how can I squeeze the maximum I can out of this? People leave a lot more money on the table on the upside than on the downside. Um, and a risk manager is a lot more help um, when things are going well. You know, if things just go against you, you do your stop yourself out. You go and you find a new trade. You don't need to pay a risk manager a lot of money to tell you uh, that. But when things are starting to go your way and, and you know, then you've got little reverses, things like that, that's where your attitude toward risk becomes very important. Can you expand on that a little further? You said that traders leave a lot of money on the table on the upside. How can we take some of that money off the table? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, 
you know, it, it's a question mostly of thinking things out ahead of time. I mean, again, the, the way a lot of traders approach things is, okay, I've got, I've got this thesis, and uh, it looks like a good thesis. And then they, and, and when, once they convince themselves, okay, this is a good thesis, they immediately turn to the downside. If they don't turn to the downside at all, then they're not traders. But they turn to the downside, they say, okay, you know, what might go wrong with this? How could I lose money on this? How can I size it or, or set it up? You know, often there are trades that are, too risky on a naked basis, but you can figure a way to do it on a spread, you know, with, with some other positions such that you uh, make the downside tolerable. And they tend to spend a lot of time planning that. I would say a lot of 80% of the pre-trade strategizing tends to go on, uh, you know, uh, capping the downside and, and, uh, and, and dealing with it. I, I tell them, you know, switch that around. Spend 20% of your time, you know, capping the downside is important. You got to think it through. But honestly, if on the downside, things aren't going the way you predict and it's not worth spending a lot of effort figuring out exactly what, you know, once you're wrong, you could be wrong about a lot of stuff and, and it's hard to predict exactly how you're wrong. Um, but if you're right, why exactly are you right? You know, often you have three or four reasons why you like a trade. Well, you know, trot them out one at a time and figure out exactly how much each one means and, you know, set a reasonable strategy for, uh, um, for, for, for taking profits, not just, you know, gee, I'm going to get out what I've made, you know, uh, 10, 10 points on this one, but, um, okay. You know, if it goes up quickly, this is what I'm going to do. If it goes up slowly, if it goes up and this other thing goes up, I'm going to do this. You, you don't have to map everything out. You don't have to have an algorithm that tells you exactly what you're going to do. Although I have spent a lot of my career doing quantitative trading where you do exactly that. You write a computer program to do all this stuff. Um, but you don't have to do that level. You ought to have some fairly sophisticated thoughts um, about how you're going to exit this, exit this trade at a profit. Um, and that's where it's so easy to, you know, you're right, you're happy, you want to grab, you know, what you've got to date. Um, it's especially, here's a one that happens a lot, you know, you made a lot quickly and now it's kind of slowly giving back, um, but you really haven't gotten up to the point where you, uh, uh, where, where you had planned initially. Um, people love to win, you know, people would rather, you know, win 80% of the time than, you know, win 40% of the time, but actually walk away with more money. Uh, this is something we know we see in poker too. There are people they want to win a lot of pots and that's not really the goal. The goal is to walk away with more money than you started. And sometimes that means losing most of the pots, but you know, winning a few big ones. Um, trading doesn't have to be like that. You know, there are traders who make money 80% of their trades. There are traders who make money 5% of their trades, but they just make so much on those they can afford it. You got to know who you are and you got to know what you're going for. As a risk manager, do you have a, a preference for which type of strategy? I don't know if you would prefer is the right word, but like, like, would you rather that someone traded a strategy with a high win rate and took a lot of small gains and occasional larger losses or the characteristics of a low win rate is typically that you win really big occasionally, but you often take a lot of small losses. Like, do you have a, is there any theory behind which is, I know better is the wrong word, but I think you kind of know what I'm getting at. Sure. Um, and I have actually two answers to that. One is empirical and one is theoretical. Uh, empirically, one of the strongest regularities we observe in trading is that you want to pick uh, your, your profit ratio. And by profit ratio, I mean uh, the average win on winning trades divided by the average loss on losing trades. You know, and you can have a win ratio of, you know, 0.1, you know, if you have a very high win rate or you can have a win ratio of uh, 50, you probably have a very low win rate if you do that. You should pick your payout ratio and you should let them, and the market is going to tell you what your win rate is. And you just really have no control over that. And you shouldn't pay any attention to it. You shouldn't let it worry you. You'll go through times when your win rate is, you know, let's say you're typically you're a trader. You got a profit ratio of, of one. So your wins are as big as your losses. You expect a 60% win rate. And, you know, you go through a stretch where you got 40% win rate. You're losing money. Uh, there's a real temptation to say, okay, I'm going to shrink my payout ratio. I'm going to take my profits earlier. Um, um, I'm going to let my losses run a little longer and that way I'll get my win rate up back to the 60%. I think it should be. That's almost always disastrous. 
Um, um, or similarly, maybe you got a win rate of 70% for a while. So you say, Hey, I'm going to, you know, adjust my payout ratio. You know, your payout ratio is what a trader should pick and believe in and, and trade for. And the market is going to give you the win rate in the long run, but it's, you know, it's going to vary up and down the short term and there's really nothing you can do about it without hurting your trading. So the first thing I say is pick your, you know, pick your profit ratio and let your win ratio be whatever it is. Um, the second thing is there are risks to both kinds of strategy and, and, and people don't, um, you know, people don't think through it well enough. They tend to think that one is good and one is bad. There are different problems with each. So, if, you know, if you're doing this strategy where, you know, you're winning a small amount of money, money most of the time, uh, but every so often there's a big loss, you've got to be really sure that you're know, taking some of those profits and you're putting them aside, uh, you know, mentally or, or preferably actually in a formal uh, system um, that's just saved up. For those occasional disasters, you're like an insurance company. You're collecting premiums every day. Usually, you don't have to pay a loss, but once in a while, this loss comes. Well, you better not have spent all the premiums, or you won't be able to uh, um, pay off the loss. Um, but the other side. So let's say you're, you know, taking little losses every day, in the hopes of, you know, every so often making a big uh, a profit. Um, that's fine. But in a way, you got to think about, okay, every day these losses, I'm like paying them into this account. And you know, like you're buying insurance, you got to be sh sure the insurance company is going to be there to pay off when you win. Um, so you've got to be very, think very hard about who is going to pay me uh, this big amount that I expect to make once in a while. And I'm sure they're going to be able to do it. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be willing to do it or, or, or will have the money if they do. So. And, and again, once you know your payout ratio, you can start thinking about the questions like this and know which which of these two questions you got to ask yourself. I really love the insurance analogy. That's brilliant. Did you just make that up on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've had a lot of experience uh, okay. <laughs> uh, talking about these to people. Um, we talk about this a lot when we do kind of option groups because we one of the things we like to do as risk managers, at least quantitative risk managers, is say, okay, you know, your trading strategy, you're you're basically buying this option and um, or, or or selling an option depending on, on on what it is. And let's think about you know the terms you're getting on this thing. You know, are you are you really paying too much for this option? Or are you selling it too cheap? Um, and, and in option pricing terms, you know, that's exactly how you think. This episode of Chat with Traders is supported by TradeStation. Now, many of you will already know I'm a great advocate of TradeStation and I do put my money where my mouth is because I trade with TradeStation. And I know it can be a real challenge and often quite overwhelming for traders who are just starting out and even traders who have been doing this for a while to discover a credible broker which checks all the boxes. Now, I'm here to tell you that TradeStation just might be that broker. TradeStation are fully licensed, have been established since 1982, recently won Barron's Award as the online brokerage best for frequent traders, and I can also tell you TradeStation's platform available for web, mobile and desktop is brilliant and so are their low commission rates. Plus, I've always found their customer support to be very helpful too. If you'd like to just test the waters, you can fund an account with as little as $500. For instructions on how to do this and to learn more about TradeStation, please visit TradeStation dot com slash traders also sponsoring this episode is jet smarter the mobile app which is really shaking up and disrupting the industry of private air travel that's right folks we're talking about private jets and how with jet smarter flying private is now within reach using the jet smarter app you're able to create on-demand flights anywhere on the planet or alternatively reserve seats on shared flights with other members all within minutes from your mobile. Members also enjoy unparalleled travel benefits including complimentary round trip seats on global shuttle routes, discounted seats for guests, helicopter transfers in select cities, invites to VIP events and much more. Discover a smarter way to fly 
Download the JetSmarter app today and use the code SMART to become part of the world's largest members-only private aviation community. And for more info, visit jetsmarter.com. Now, I think this is an interesting question. Are there types of risk that are either hidden or unknown to most traders and investors? And I guess I'm partly asking this question because I've just recently read uh, Black Swan from a buddy of yours, Nassim Taleb. You know, he talks a lot about this stuff, like the unknown unknowns. How do you think about this sort of thing as a risk manager? And do other traders need to kind of wake up to these unknown unknowns? Well, okay, here's the problem. And I'll tell you, Nassim gets very frustrated because people say, people <laughs> come up to me, they've asked him this question, actually, since even before he wrote the book, because he was, you know, saying a lot of this stuff um, before they say, okay, um, what should I do about it? You know, um, how can I predict black swans? And the whole point is you can't predict them. If you can predict them, they're not black swans. Um, you know, and, and how can I plan for them? We that really misses the point. What those people are really saying is they don't really believe they're black swans. They just think there are things other people overlook that they can be uh, clever enough to see. And uh, Nassim's uh, position, and I completely agree with him on this, is there are just fundamental things that we can never predict. There are things that happen because they're unexpected. Uh, the example he gave in Back and Fooled by Randomness, one of his earlier books, is, you know, we had this uh, terrorist attack on 9-11, uh, 2001. And before that, we knew there were hijackers. There'd been lots and lots of airplane hijackers, but all of them had wanted to survive. And we had lots and lots of suicide bombers, but all of them were low skill young men with very simple plots who struck close to home. Um, and so we had defenses against both of those things. But because we had never had a sophisticated, uh, higher skilled people uh, who were willing to do a suicide attack using by hijacking airplanes, we really didn't have any defenses against that. But that's exactly the reason it happened. If somebody had thought of that and we had built defenses against that, they would have figured out something else to do. So it, it's, it's pointless to try to figure out all these things that might happen. What you need to have is you would you need to have a plan, a long-term life plan, basically, but certainly a trading plan that on average will be able to take advantage of unexpected events, of disruptions. You don't want to have something that's so um, fragile and so, uh, you know, tightly constructed that if the markets change behavior in any way, it's going to blow up everything you do. And this is what happens sometimes. People have these very highly levered, very specific strategies based on, um, you know, empirical regularities or theories that, that have worked very well in the past. But if anything changes in the market, um, they, they, they can get blown up. Uh, you much, much prefer to have these uh, robust strategies that actually do better uh, if something uh, um, unexpected happens. And uh, one of the ways I like to put it is, and, and this, is, this is actually, I use this to summarize the seems investment philosophy. You know, you fill one of your pockets with insurance policies and you fill the other pocket with lottery tickets. And then if anything, you know, unexpected happens, probably you got something in one of your two pockets uh, that's going to profit from this. Uh, if you make a business writing insurance policies and selling lottery tickets, then if anything unexpected happens, you're probably toast. I tell you, people spend a lot of time worrying about exactly what bad events or, or surprising events are going to happen. And there just isn't very much um, value in that. Uh, another thing I like to say is I say, OK, there's an infinite number of uh, disasters that could happen to us. But there's actually a fairly small number of ways uh, that they're going to play out. Um, you know, if you're running a hedge fund, for example, you know, anything could happen in the world. But, you know, what's going to do it well? Maybe it's going to, you know, seize up all your cash and you're going to have trouble making margin calls. Maybe you won't be able to trade something. Uh, maybe you won't be able to get good price information on something. Uh, maybe somebody who owes you money or otherwise has promised something won't be able to deliver. And, and if you think about things in that sense, you really think, OK, so I got to worry about my cash. I got to worry about my access to trading. I got to worry about my counterparty risk. I don't really have to worry about why those things went bad in some future scenario or how bad they might get. I just want to say, OK, I've got some some plans in place, some contingency plans in place uh, to protect me against those things. 
and they're never going to be big enough to cover anything that might happen. But you, you know, make them as big as you reasonably can, and you just live with whatever else, you know, whatever residual risk comes up. Yeah. Is that difficult to sort of accept as a risk manager? Like, you know, <laughs> as the title says, you're there to manage the risk, and you have to, in some ways, just accept that you're not going to be able to manage every possible risk that might play out. Well, no, I, I wouldn't put it that way. You're not able to predict the risk. Again, you know, so a lot of people think that a risk manager's job is to predict and prevent disaster, but that's actually closer to the opposite. You know, the people who try to predict, who try to guess the future are the enemies of risk management. You know, they're the ones who say, you know, build the wall on the north side of town because that's where the attack will come from. And the risk manager says, look, if you leave any gap in the walls anywhere, that's where the attack will come from. Uh, don't try to guess what's going to happen. Prepare for anything that might happen. And, and, and you know, you've spent all your time trying to prevent disaster. You just kill risk. You kill opportunity. Um, the idea is to survive disaster. And, and generally speaking, as a risk manager, if you find that we have, you know, mitigants in place or, or you know, uh, uh, things in place that limit our, our actions that are designed to make things better in the worst case, you want to be sure those things only kick in when it gets really bad. I don't want to have, you know, limits that protect against, uh, you know, moderately bad down day. I want limits that, you know, kick in when survival is at stake. Um, you know, you do too much protection and you, uh, you kill more opportunity than you reduce risk. And by killing the opportunity, you're not going to have the profits, you know, accumulated over the good times uh, enough to pay for the problems in bad times. Uh, another thing I tell people, I say, look, every, you know, anytime in talking about a new product approval process or a new strategy or a new fund, whatever, somebody's trying to do something new, I say, you know, every idea anybody ever had uh, uh, makes money for a while and then loses it. You know, something always happens that uh, causes some loss. And, and you want to prepare for that. You want to, you know, build the thing so you're making enough money when things are going well that it offsets the loss when it ends. And the mistake people make, a classic uh, risk avoider uh, mistake, is to you know start really small to kind of look at something and stay out of it until you're sure it's going to work. And because lots of people have been doing it for years and it always works. And then you start really small to make sure you don't make any mistakes. And then once you kind of get confident that this thing works, then you're way behind everybody else because you waited so long and you started so small. So you start getting bigger. You get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what that guarantees is when there is a problem, when things do turn around and you have a loss, you have far larger exposure than you had in the good times. So you don't have the profits from the good side, good times to pay for the losses on much larger positions uh, when it fails. And so, you know, what I tell people, you plan for success. You know, you don't spend too much time worrying about stuff when you decide you're going to take a risk, you take it. You pick a size and you stick with that size. Um, and, you know, that way you can accumulate enough uh, when, you're, when you're working and, and when it goes bad, you know, you won't have bigger exposures and you'll be able to afford them. Yeah, that's a really helpful tip right there, folks. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really good. Um, I'd love to speak with you a little bit about what separates good risk taking from reckless risk taking? I think we might have touched on it a little bit earlier, but let's go into uh, let's go into it a little further. So, yeah, what separates good risk taking from reckless risk taking? Well, two things, I guess. One is if you're making these decisions emotionally, then then uh, you're probably reckless, and if you're not reckless, you're probably something else. So, so one thing is good risk taking is disciplined, is well thought out in advance. Uh, for me, that means it's quantitative, but you don't actually have to do numbers. You do have to uh, really think it through. And a very important piece of advice is, is to focus on the median outcome. You know, focus on, don't focus on the average outcome, you know, the, the average of all the things that might happen, because that's not very meaningful. That's not very helpful. Say, you know, if, if I get average luck, you know, if, if I get the kind of luck I get where half the time I'll do better and half the time I'll do worse. Would, would I take this risk? Uh, and the reason for this is that, you know, over your life, over everybody's lifetime, you're going to take millions and millions of risks. And you're going to come very close to your median outcome. You know, there really can't be lucky or unlucky people uh, um, in the long run if they're keeping their bets, you know, roughly the same size. The way you get to be a lucky person is to put too much 
on one bet and then win it. And the way you get to be an unlucky person is to put too little on a bet um, and lose it. And I should say, by the way, here, <laughs> I'm counting people who are born into reasonably free countries and reasonably prosperous times who aren't terribly abused at children. I mean, you know, most people who get to their uh, uh, adult life, adulthood in reasonably decent shape, um, they're not going to, you know, they can't really blame luck or, or, or hope for luck too much. So if you go for the uh, decisions that make risk, that the win half the time, um, uh, and, you know, in, in the median case, you're going to come out pretty well. If you go for a lot of things that have bad median outcomes, but uh, good average outcomes, uh, you, you blow up. It doesn't work. And there's, there's sort of some mathematical reasons for it. It ties in with the Kelly criterion. You know, most people think that as you take more and more risk, you increase the chance of very good and very bad outcomes. Uh, but what Kelly showed is that, no, after a certain point, as you take more risk, all you do is increase both the probability and the size of the bad outcomes. Uh, the chance of the good outcomes goes away. Um, so now knowing exactly where that Kelly point is uh, can be very tricky and you can misestimate it. But if you're not thinking in those terms, you're not even, you know, there's no way you'll even come close to it. We focus on, don't, don't, you know, you should, the question you ask yourself is with average luck, you know, if I'm thinking of 10 risks and they're all roughly 50 50, don't think about, you know, what's the average outcome. Think about if I win half of these and lose half of them, am I going to be better off? Right, right. Okay. And while we're on this subject, what are your thoughts on these different, uh, I don't know if you want to call them risk models, but like things like Cali Criterion. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you were quite involved in the value at risk, uh, the concept of value at risk. What are your thoughts on these different types of models and are they useful in a trading sense? Okay, Kelly, absolutely. Every trader should understand Kelly. Uh, there's a very interesting experiment uh, done by a guy named... Uh, uh, Victor Hakani and Richard Dewey. Uh, Rick, Victor Hakani was a guy at long-term capital management, the hedge fund that blew up spectacularly in 1998, but a very smart guy. And what he did is he got uh, young financial professionals and also some students, all of these people had been trained in quantitative finance, and, and he let them play a computer game um, where they started with $25, real dollars, and they could make bets and they could do this for half an hour. It's on a computer. Uh, they could bet any amount up to their total wealth on these coin flips that had a 60% chance of winning. And if you understand Kelly, or if you understand risk-taking in general, if you understand focusing on the median outcome, it, it, it's immediately obvious to you what you should do, that you should bet, you know, some people will say $2, some people say $5, you know, but, you know, somewhere in that uh, range, and sort of gradually increase your bets as you win money, so you're betting around, you know, somewhere on the order of 10, 15 percent of your uh, of, of your wealth. And you're virtually guaranteed to get up to two hundred fifty dollars, which is the ma I'm sorry, uh, three hundred dollars. I think three hundred dollars was the maximum you could win. And you're virtually guaranteed to get there, you know, in, in half an hour because you make these bets like every few seconds. Um, almost nobody did that. Most of the people went broke. You know, people bet all their money and lost it too quickly. People bet like a penny, you know, and tried to get up that way, whatever. And these were people who were trained in the best, you know, financial quantitative work. A lot of them were working for hedge funds or for uh, places that invest. Uh, they just didn't understand the basic mathematics of risk taking. And, and if you don't, you know, you got to read Kelly. You got to read how uh, actually the best thing to do is read a guy named Ed Thorpe. He explains it uh, uh, better than anybody. But, um, so that's essential. Value at risk is very different. Um, value at risk comes about that for, if you're a quant, you're spending a lot of your energy, you know, looking at estimating distributions, trying to figure out what happens most of the time and what the probabilities are. And, and what we discovered primarily in 1987, but, but, you know, it's been learned many times since is that sometimes unexpected things happen and you can't really put them into your probability model. Um, you could call them black swans or, or gray swans or something like that. But what you want to do is you want to say, okay, 99% of the time, 99% of the days are normal days. And I can kind of figure out what, I can use data to figure out what's going to happen and what the probabilities are and you know, come up with an optimal 
solution. And 1% of the time, I got no idea what's going to happen. You know, maybe the market will be closed. Maybe the market will go down five times as much in a day as it ever has before. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, uh, financial relations that have been, you know, things that have traded together for decades are going to suddenly uh, trade differently, whatever. And I'm not going to try to predict them. I'm not going to worry about them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with this trading strategy. I'm going to optimize it for the 99% of the things I have data. And then I'm going to say, okay, what are some events I can imagine uh, that, would, that would harm the strategy, that would you know, really cause and stress tests for it? And you don't want a million stress tests. You don't want one. You want about five is a good number, three, or three to five. You know, what are the three to five big things that could completely derail the strategy, not cause, you know, a normal loss that will happen, you know, in the 99% of days, but, you know, come out of the blue, you know, a couple of times a year, maybe a couple of times a decade, um, and, uh, and really blow the strategy out of the water. And you make sure you have contingency plans for those. Uh, the value at risk is the dividing line. It says, okay, losses up to this point, we're going to consider are happen from normal events. Uh, the losses beyond this point, they might be, you know, normal days that were just worse than, you know, not, you know, not the 99th percent worse, but the 99.5 percent worse or something. But a lot of them are going to be different events of completely different character where we just can't predict them and we don't know the rules. So you've got these two regimes. You've got sort of the known comfortable regime where you have data and you can calculate things very precisely. And you have this other regime where you can't uh, uh, compute anything and you just want to make sure you can survive. Uh, the big disasters you can envision. Um, and this turned out to be, you know, nobody really thought this was a great idea or that it was, you know, the right way to look at things or whatever. Turned out to be enormously valuable. And the reason, you know, if you talk to a risk manager who's actually made risk decisions, you got to be careful. A lot of people call themselves risk managers. You know, they're never called upon to make a risk decision. They're not the person sitting in the with the trader or the executive committee, you know, when a big risk decision has to be made. Uh, with their input really taken seriously. Um, but if you do this, if you've done this for more than 10 years, I would say, because you need about 10 years to really kind of see all the ups and downs and the way it can work out and the way it doesn't. They have this superstitious adherence to VAR because if you really try to compute the value of risk, you really try to compute, you know, what's the loss going to be on the 1% worst days? And, uh, and you, validate it very rigorously so you make sure you're getting it exactly right you learn a lot of stuff you start you, and you just learn that the stuff you learn to make your var model work to make your var model you know have the right back test in it turns out to be exactly the stuff that you know 18 months two years later everybody's worrying about now that doesn't make you immune to risk you know but but if uh, you know I remember when high frequency trading suddenly, you know, jumped up and everybody was afraid their, their returns were getting sabotaged by high frequency traders. Well, I remember you know, it was like two years before that that I had started saying, hey, we have to account for these high frequency traders in order to predict our VAR properly. Now, that doesn't mean you know what to do. Uh, it just means that while everybody else is just starting on the learning curve on this thing, you actually know something about it. Um, and that's very important as a risk manager. You may not know enough about it to really help, but at least you you know, seen it in advance, you're not completely blindsided by it. And usually, you know who to call. You say, well, I haven't, I'm not really an expert on this stuff, but I know enough about it to make our bar model work. And here's the guy who really understands it, you know, and I've been through all the people who uh, claim they understand it, but really don't, or are just selling opinions or something. Here's a guy I can really talk to who, who can help us on this. And time and time again, that proves very useful. As a risk manager, you know, you're never going to be right all the time. Uh, you, you know, hopefully you're right 51% of the time or something like that. But you never want to be, um, have nothing to do or nothing to say, right? So when they have this meeting, you say, okay, it's the high frequency traders. I know who to call. I know what to investigate. You know, I can know what to get to work on um, in order to make this decision. And if you hadn't been computing a VAR every day for the last 10 years, you know, you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have been aware of this and you would have been just as clueless as everyone else in the meeting. Is it the case that VAR or value at risk is perhaps more useful to someone who's managing money, managing a portfolio rather than someone who's just an independent trader or can it be quite useful for both? No, no, it would be very useful for a independent trader. The trouble is that you probably can't afford the investment 
uh, to do it. I won't say it's a full time job to, to keep a bar model working, but it's a you know it's a significant portion of your energy, and it really needs to be a specialist. It needs to be somebody who's kind of a, a little removed from the day to day trading models and decisions. So unless you're you know so successful, you can afford to hire somebody to do this for you. Um, I don't think you'll really get the benefit of it. So it makes the most sense a big trading desk, um, um, you know, where where you can really um, put somebody on that. But the general idea, I think, is still useful. You know, it, it, as 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 a trader, you know, you want to have some idea of what's what's normal and what isn't, and you want to. I, I don't think it's useful to conflate the two and try to come up with a market analysis that covers the normal days and the abnormal days both. You know, the normal days. You generally look at very short-term quantitative data. You want to know, you know, what did the market do in the last week and month, you know, maybe three months at the most. And you look at quantitative data, you know, percentage up and down, standard deviation, mean return, things like that. Um, but when you get to those other 1% of days, you got to say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to look for qualitative data. I'm going to go long in the past, you know, what happened in 1998, what happened in 2008, what happened in 2000, what happened in 1987. Um, and I'm going to not just look at the specific uh, thing I'm trading, but I'm going to look at other markets. You know, you're going to say, okay, what happens? You know, maybe, maybe you're trading oil. You know, okay, you know, maybe we've never had this event happen in oil, but what happened when it happened in the stock market? What happened when it happened in, you know, corn futures? And, you know, it's very important to read a lot, to read a lot of history, to talk to people who've been through a lot of things, because those insights are going to be the ones that guide you on the weird days. You're not going to be able to use a lot of people, you know, the weird day comes and they try to use their models that are calibrated for the other 99%. And, and not only is it useless, it's actually dangerous. But you also can't trade every day, you know, thinking, okay, this is going to be the one day, you know, everybody talks about for years, um, or you'll never, you know, never put on a position. Right. And if someone is interested, just uh, someone's curious, just to find out a little bit more about VAR, are there any resources you'd recommend? I know you've written uh, a few books. Is it covered in any of those or are there any other resources online which uh, you might point people to? Yeah, I, I hate to recommend my own books here, but I honestly, the, the, the only one I would recommend to kind of a, a non-specialist, somebody who doesn't want to be a risk manager uh, but wants to really understand VAR, not just, you know, kind of the uh, – academic understanding or the regulator understanding. Uh, my book, Financial Risk Management for Dummies, uh, has a chapter on it. And it's uh, that is directly intended to explain it to someone who, you know, who, who, who needs it, who, you know, who's professionally interested in it, but who is not a risk manager, not necessarily a quant but needs to understand it to the level that they can uh, do it for themselves. And, and frankly, again, I don't want to just uh, get on here to plug my own books, but I think if you are um, an independent trader, you're running a small trading shop and you either can't afford or would never tolerate a independent risk manager around. Um, I think that's the book that can kind of tell you, you can read it. You can say, okay, now I know what a risk manager would do. Um, some people are going to say, okay, I can, you know, do most of this that I need on my own. Other people will say, I don't want to do any of this, but at least I know, you know, I know what I'm rejecting. And that's where I would go to learn about VAR and some of the other standard risk management tools. Yeah, totally. And that's available on Amazon, right? Is that probably the best place to get it? Um, yeah, it's the Ford Dummies uh, brand. They, they publish books all over the place. You know, they've got the yellow cover and the pointy headed guy or pointy chinned guy. Uh, it, it should be widely available. I hope it's available in Australia. Yeah, oh, I'm sure it is. And what's the title again, just in case anyone missed that? Financial Risk Management for Dummies. Okay, very good. And just going back to a point you made earlier, you brought up uh, Victor Hagani um, about his uh, coin flip experiment. I actually had him on the podcast uh, a couple months back oh. purely to talk about that experiment because I came across his the white paper and sort of the articles he published around that and I thought it was really interesting. So I invited him onto the podcast and we spent probably about 45 minutes just discussing that experiment. So if anyone uh, listening to this right now is interested in hearing a bit more about that specifically, um, I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes. Uh, that's great. I should listen to that. I, uh, I know him, but 
I'm interested to hear his, uh, you know, you know how he's done. It really is a fascinating thing, and it really should, you know, it should have had every finance professor in the country sitting up and saying, "Boy, we're we're not training our students right." You know, it's like if a medical school discovered that their students were, you know, killing people. Um, but it did. <laughs> you know, I've never met an <laughs> academic who, who, you know, heard of it, or if they heard of it, you know, took it seriously, thought it was important. You know, it's just amazing how many people teach finance, work for finance. And I'm talking big global banks, you know, that should have the best and brightest and be able to afford anybody who really don't believe any of this stuff. <laughs> you know, they don't really believe that people are betting money and you win or you lose and you got to take it seriously. They just think of it as some, you know, big company that has earnings and the earnings somehow flow through. Um, or if you're a finance professor, you train these students and they go out and they get jobs and people pay them salaries. Um, the essential betting nature of all of this and the risk taking nature of all of this, people are really great at ignoring. Yeah. And you, you when you brought up Kelly, uh, when we were talking about this coin flip experiment, I mean, I guess the big difference between the coin flip experiment and financial markets is with the coin bet experiment, you knew exactly what your, how much you stood to gain and how much you stood to lose on any flip. So the, the probabilities in the math, I guess, is probably a bit easier. When you want to talk about Cali and applying that to financial markets, you don't have those, those fixed outcomes. There's a lot more variables. So is Cali still useful to have a grasp on and, and does it have any implementation in financial markets? Like, is it, uh, is it as effective? Yes, absolutely. It's more effective. The whole point about it that's so great is that you don't need to get everything exactly right. You know, if you go to a finance professor, an economist, and you say, how should I size my positions? They have to know the probability distribution of everything you're trading and everything else you ever might trade and, you know, all future, whatever. And they can't get all of that, so they make some approximation. Kelly says, look, all I really want to know is how much can you lose if you're wrong? Um, and, and what do you think your edge is? And yeah, sure, you don't know those for sure. But, you know, as a trader, you, you, how much you can lose? Well, that's your job. It's your job to say, okay, when I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose on this trade? I can't pick it exactly. You know, I mean, I might have my stop at a, uh, you know, $10,000 loss, but I might get, you know, I might get some slippage and lose 12 or 13,000. But, Basically, you're going to design this trade position with a maximum loss in mind, and you have an idea what your edge is. And let's say you're wrong. Let's say you think your edge is, you know, 2% and it's really 1%. Well, then you're going to be sizing your positions twice as big as they should be, but that's not a big deal, really. Um, the problem is when people size their positions 10 or 100 times as big as they should be, or one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of the size. Uh, Kelly is going to get you in the ballpark, plus... And here's the really important part. You'll be able to go back and look and you'll be able to say, okay, you know, I thought I had an edge of 2%. I'm actually only demonstrating an edge of 1%. Um, I got to think it, you know, did I just go through a bad period or, or should I, you know, cut my trade sizes and, uh, and uh, you know, in, in light of this new thing. And if you say I'm sizing this trade as if the maximum I can lose is $10,000 and I actually lost $25,000, well, I got to, you know, uh, fix my either – my stop policies or, or, uh, or I've got to, you know, stick a bigger number in Kelly when I, when I do my calculation. Again, that'll mean a smaller position size. Of, uh, you have bigger losses. So you're thinking about things the right way. You can track things, you can calibrate things and you can get better. And, 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 and you start in the ball, ballpark. See, the problem is, if, uh, Victor Hagkari's, um, experiment had shown, well, you know, people should have bet $2 to $5 and they were betting $6 or they're betting $1.75 then um, that's no big deal. But they're not. They're betting zero. They're betting a penny. They're betting 25. They're betting their whole money, you know. So that to me says they didn't understand the concept of Kelly. It wasn't they understood Kelly, but they calculated it wrong. It's, it's they had no idea of this basic idea of there being an optimal size to a bet. Um, I will tell you one other anecdote about this. There, there's something called the blackjack ball. Uh, happens once a year in Las Vegas for, you know, the the – uh, group of, uh, card counters who are, you know, some of the best back blackjack players or whatever. It's, it's actually, it's this weird, very secret event that you have to, they only tell you, but they get a call in your hotel room like two hours before about where it is and, and, and so on. But, uh, cause they're, they're afraid, you know, casino security people will come and bomb the place. But, um, I asked people, you know, I asked people there that, uh, I said, um, 
you know, what would you do? And not all these guys are quants, you know, not all these guys are, are great thinking. Everybody just immediately said without calculating, without thinking about it, came up with a reasonable number, you know, $4, $3, $5, whatever. Um, um, and, and had the basic strategy that you increase your, uh, bet in proportion, uh, to your wealth. And this just comes from a lifetime of making these betting decisions. You know, a, a gambler, however educated, would never get as wrong as these finance people who had all the education and all the math. And by the way, they had all the exact numbers too. They didn't even have to guess about what their edge was or how much they could lose if they were wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of embarrassing for them, isn't it? <laughs> it should be, but I don't think they're embarrassed. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the crazy part. Yeah. Finance professors said, well, yeah, you know, we got to change the way we teach or, or, you know, students said, well, we got to go learn Kelly. And I'd say, okay, you know, you learned your lesson. You, you learned something about yourself. That's how you learn. You know, as a trader, you do something, you lose, and then you go fix it. You don't have to get embarrassed. But if you lose and you just write it off and say, oh, well, <laughs> you know, I guess I lost, um, you know, you're, it, I don't uh, hold out much hope for your trading career. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, Aaron, well, let's uh, leave it at this for now. Now, like you mentioned just before, you do have, um, you mentioned one book before. I know you have a couple others as well. Um, you know, if someone's interested in this sort of stuff, uh, which is maybe the best book to begin with? I have a feeling you're going to say the Four Dummies one, but um, what are your other books about? The poor dummies one is if you want to learn technical risk management, you know, I mean, I, I mean, if you want to learn the minimum, you have to know about it uh, in, in the easiest way. My other books, A Poker Face of Wall Street has been the most popular one. Um, I think that's, you know, if you the stuff we talked about last hour, you know, how you feel about gambling, uh, how people develop these skills, um, how uh, gambling and poker relate to financial trading. That's that's all in that one. Uh, Red-Blooded Risk, among other things, by the way, Red-Blooded Risk has an epilogue that turned out to be really popular. I just kind of stuck it in as an afterthought. A um, hundred books. <laughs> I recommended a hundred books that kind of uh, cover these things. And that's been gotten a lot of emails about that, a lot of interest in that. So even if you don't get that book, you can go to Amazon and do the look inside the book and, and just go to the that. And, and there's a hundred books. And I'm sure you'll find one or two in there uh, you'll like. Um, a red blooded risk is more about uh, Wall Street and how people use these ideas in uh, finance, both historically and, uh, and and currently. And it's sub subtitled "The Secret History of Wall Street." It uh, you know it tries to show you a lot about how this stuff really works on Wall Street, you know, how Wall Street really works, as opposed to kind of the story uh, people sell to the public uh, and to regulators. And uh, and then my other book is A World of Chance, which I'm a co-author of with Ruben Brenner. That's an economics book. That's a book about uh, randomness and chance and probability in economics. Um, again, more for the kind of academic economic uh, interest, not directly related to trading. Okay, cool. Well, I'll make sure there's links to all of those in the show notes so um, anyone can find those there. And I'm sure they're also available on Amazon. Uh, and Aaron, you have your own website as well with a little bit on it. Um, if someone wants to find out more about you, um, what is the link for that website? Sure. It's eRader, E-R-A-I-D-E-R.com. That was a uh, public mutual fund I had about 20 years ago where we did some activist investing and we tried to get shareholders on the internet to uh, uh, vote their stock and, uh, and change the way companies were run. It was a lot of fun, although it didn't make any money in the end. Um, but, uh, but so I kept the site eRater.com and uh, I've got some stuff on betting on football. I got some a little, a little bit of bi biographical stuff. I have links to the Bloomberg columns and Wilmot columns I write. So if people want more Aaron Brown, there's plenty there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, they have another two hours right now. So I have to say, Aaron, I'm very grateful uh, for your time. Uh, it's been a real honor to speak with you and being able to pick your brain for two hours about um, all things related to risk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been fun. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.